Welcome to Insight. Today we're chatting with John Henry, Executive Director of the Flynn Institute of Arts, who has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. And John, thank you so much for sharing the work that you've done over these last 26 years with the Flint Institute of Arts, this community, this board. You have really seen a complete transformation of this institution from the day you walked through these doors, haven't you? Mm, yeah, I'd say so. We turned it around. What Took, was it like? I came here knowing that the job was to fluff things up a little bit, to fluff up our aura, I used to like to say. Um, it, was, it was quiet. It was, um, you didn't have the curb appeal that I wanted it to have. The collection at this museum was really noteworthy, but not shown to its... It had elements that were, that oh, it had, were interesting. Let's call it potential. It had right. tremendous potential here, but it had gotten kind of sleepy. And um, that appealed to me. I, I knew what I could do. Um, I didn't know if I could do it here, but I knew that it could be done and that I wanted to do it. I mark my calendar to be done with it in about seven years. I figured with the experience I'd had with other museums, it takes that long to gain the trust of the community, particularly among donors, and to sell some ideas, sometimes big ideas that would require a lot of change. As we know, change is hard for a lot of people. It actually took seven years to get really out of the gate to really get the first big thing done. And this is such an interesting community because I remember when I was being interviewed for the position, one of the board members uh, took me aside and said, you know, one thing you're gonna learn about this place is that people here will give and then they'll give again and then they'll give again. And it's really proven to be true. And it, it no, no more so than when we cut the ribbon on our first big overhaul of the building. And what date was that? Uh, that was in 2005. 2005. Yeah. So in 2005, what was the difference between the building that you had delivered, where you were cutting the ribbon, and you were welcoming the public in, and the building that you found when you first came? It was a, quite a big transformation. By the time I got here, the studios were not occupied by museum educators, but by uh, local college art departments. Right. Not only did we not have control of the studios, but we really didn't benefit from having uh, our own identity associated with the school. Mm -hmm. During those first years, part of the process was to move the university classes back to their own campuses. Right. And that wasn't easy. And in doing that, you also reclaimed that space for studio arts over time so that you could create a balance in terms of programming. Well, that's true. And we got 11 studios back. It was like building a brand new building. Right. I mean, we had a big operation suddenly. But you also had to, to do renovation that allowed for traffic flow now with more access to the space to actually be more Well, functional. that's right. Access and wayfinding were a really big part of, of the plan. And the museum side of it, the museum was a substantial size, mm -hmm. but it had problems to solve. The front entrance, uh, you, you walked right into the gift shop. So if we, if we had any kind of event, we had to have guards there to keep the merchandise on the shelves. Right. So we, we repurposed so much of the space made it safer for people, made it more logical for people to get around, and made it a much better environment to present works of art as well. Now that's in 2005, but that's only the first of a series of projects. Well, so that, let's... and back to that point about we'll give and give and give again, we were cutting the ribbon and a patron came up to me and he said, well, what's next? And I said, I don't know, what do you mean what's next? And he said, well, where are you going to go from here, building-wise? And I said, well, the architects, it's funny you should ask, because the architects designed future additions to the building. And he said, no, I mean, how much, if, if we wanted to do it today, how much would it cost today? <laughs> and I said, well, in the next wing is a painting wing, and it would cost $7 million, and it would cost $4 million to endow. 
so that we could operate it. $11 million. $11 million. Moving now into an expanded building, this phase mm -hmm. one right. was an expansion. And I was asking the that same public to pony up, mm -hmm. you know, to take on more financial responsibility for this, this new and expanded operation. And I didn't know if I could put more on top of it. Right. But I guess what I just described to you, that whole thought process, I went through that in about a nanosecond and I said, sure, we'll build it. So we know when we cut the ribbon, we announced phase two and we added another wing. And since then, we've added um, several studios onto the studio wing and we've added a third wing onto the collection wing. But there's a lot of pride, a lot of city pride, a lot of community pride here. And I think people know that a place like this, which is so public, and so egalitarian. I mean, you don't have to be a member here like a country club or a church. You can be anybody and you're welcome and you're made to feel welcome. They're gonna know that they're responsible for bringing people along to, to be proud of their community, engaged in their community, comfortable in their community. And having a gathering place for neighbors. Gathering place for neighbors. I think most donors also are familiar with what the arts can do to transform the individual and the way they see the world. The arts open up eyes, open up imaginations, open up discourse. Does the museum deal with these topics that are viewed as controversial in ways that create dialogue and more light than heat? Yes. Um, in, both intentionally and coincidentally. Mm -hmm. I mean, artists deal with topics that are current. They always have, and, and all throughout history, they have. And if you're making art, the person who is throwing uh, a, a pot right next to you might be younger or older, of a different gender, a different race, different background, different language. Yeah. Yeah. So that's part of the coincidence, there's, there's right? An, there's an exchange, both intentional and unintentional. And the associations that people make, it's a sort of passive learning that takes place. Unstructured, people self-guide. Mm -hmm. They go to things that attract them, and they get interested in something that they discover, and that kind of opens up their, their uh, curiosity and takes them maybe to something they are surprised that they now have an interest in. And one thing leads to another, and that's how we, that's how we grow. The works of art have a particular point of view mm -hmm. that the artist wants to project. One, to become identified with the artist. Right. People like to call that a style. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know who that artist is because I, I recognize the work. Right. But the artist is also making something that reflects something he's interested in. Right. Generally, something of his own time and his own environment. Could be about art, but it could be about civil society. That's right. And often it is a, a mixture of all of those things. We were talking about 19th century landscape painting. Mm -hmm. And there was a... European landscape done at about the same time as the piece next to it, which was an American landscape. Right. And the point wasn't to show that there's a big contrast between the two. And it really wasn't even about the locations, that they, the specific locations that they were in. What we, what, what we felt was a strong message in this was to understand more about what was motivating artists of that time. And particularly with the Americans who at that time, I mean, we were still carving a nation out of the wilderness. We didn't have many art academies. A lot of artists were simply trying to emulate European artists because that was what collectors wanted to have in their houses. Right. It was what um, they could sell. It's before America proved to the world that we were our own strong nation mm -hmm. and that we were proud of our own identity. This was at a time when we wanted to look 
like where their where our ancestors had come from from right. Europe, and so we were making a clear comparison in styles that the the Americans were emulating the European style. In that gallery, we were looking at landscapes, but there was another area in that gallery that dealt with um, genre pictures of common day scenes of individuals doing their daily routines. So let's talk a little bit about your studio arts programs because you have 2,200 uh, students who are enrolled. We, you know, we, we have about 2,200 enrollments a year. And then you're also providing uh, classes to academy, to the academy, the, the charter school uh, here. Yes, uh, we use talk? these studios as well for, for public school visits. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a very robust program of outreach and inreach. Um, and we, like you just mentioned, we have a, um, a STEAM Academy. That's STEM teaching with A for arts added. Right. And we are the art studios for this new academy. And they do 90 minutes a day in this facility. They do another 90 minutes at the Music Institute, uh, the Science and History Museum across the street, the planetarium next door, the the performing arts um, uh, auditoriums that are next door to that. So, so you're developing your audience of the future. You're making, you're giving people this association with art, with creation. You are talking about their power to create, right? Their power to conceive, create, translate into something that takes form under their hand. Well, maybe even more broadly than that, because not everybody's going to be an artist. Right. We're teaching them to problem solve. Artists create problems and the solutions. There's no rules to making art. Mm -hmm. So you have, to, you have to start where you're gonna start. You have to decide where you're gonna start and where you're gonna finish. So you're creating a problem and you're creating the solution. And in the process, you're communicating. So we're, we're teaching communication skills through the arts. In many classroom situations, we're also teaching collaboration. There's exchange between, between students, mm -hmm. depending on how we set up the project. Um, we're developing self-confidence because you, you're the author of something. You, you've started something, you've completed something. And if you've ever made anything, you know, you're probably pretty proud of it. Yes. Um, you would think, you know, it's their firstborn in many cases that they're never going to part with. So the arts have that kind of power. And they're, they're, so, they're so essential to the learning process. The fact that they're considered an elective or, you know, a, a, a time out from academics is such a, a detrimental concept. Are you intentionally trying in your unintentional way, right, to help the education system complement it in that particular area of design thinking, problem solving. Yeah, that's the whole deal. That's the whole deal. Yeah, and we trust in art's ability to, to change people, to make them see the world differently. Is, Think everyone, about the world. is everyone an artist? No. Okay. No, and every and not everything is art. Okay. But good art has a way of engaging people. I mean, I go back to the the root of museum. This is a place where you muse, you lose yourself in thought. That's stimulated by what artists have done that transport you to thinking of things that you don't do if you're not if you're not looking at art it's time for change it's a good thing i've been here too long i've been in the field 50 years mm. i'm proud of what i've been able to accomplish here and the people that i've worked with have done a great job they're ready to go on to new projects do new things and the world's changing philanthropy's changing things that artists are making are changing Things that people think now are art um, that weren't art before. Mm -hmm. I mean, things are really, really changing. But 
we're situated in such a unique cultural neighborhood, as you know. We've yeah. been talking about it. Across the street is the Science and History Museum, right, which has just been totally renovated. It's like a brand new operation. You've got that huge planetarium. The state's largest planetarium is next door. Mm -hmm. The Music Institute, which is the symphony, there's a dance organization associated with it. The Whiting. And leads to opportunities for collaborations that uh, really open a lot of doors. The public library is right next door. And we do so much in collaborating with them on various projects. Being right next door we can organize events with audiences that can just simply walk over here and we just walk back and forth. Not many cities have that, that luxury. Medical town, college town, culture town. Uh, and all in Flint, Michigan. So there's tremendous opportunity, really tremendous opportunity for whoever comes in to, to run this place. John Henry, thank you so much for your insights and thank you for sharing with us. Thank you.